around him, giving praises to him daily, and we can do the same thing. Come on, let's sing to him. Blessing. Blessing and honor. Yeah. Glory, Glory and power. Being to the ancient of days. The ancient of days. Yeah. From every nation. From every nation. Yeah. Everybody. All, all of creation. creation. Will bow we'll down be before, the before the ancient of days. Shalom church, to God be the glory, hallelujah, let's join our hearts together to praise and worship the Lord, let's sing our songs to glorify His name, before that let us open in the word of prayer, let's pray, Father God we come before your presence, we come to you our Heavenly Father, our Great God, our Abba Father. You are so great and awesome in our lives. Thank you for everything that you have done to us. And thank you Lord Jesus for what that you will do for us. We praise your name Lord and we glorify you. You are our hiding place. You are our fortress. You are our shelter. We bless you, O God. We praise the Holy God. We come before you, O God. We want to worship you, O God. Please, Lord, come and purify our hearts. Cleanse us, O oh God, to be worthy of you, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We want to praise the holy name of God. For you are worthy to be praised from the everlasting to the everlasting. You are our only God who deserves all worship and praises. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Let us praise and worship Him. Raise your voice to glorify His name. For He is holy. Hallelujah. Let's sing this song. Oh, 
the Lord God Almighty to reign. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the Lord God Almighty to reign. Hallelujah.
we bow down and praise and worship you, O God. Be lifted high. Let your name be lifted high. For you alone are worthy, O God. In all things and in for all my life, I am yours, O God. We are yours. We are forever yours. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We glorify your name, O oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Greetings and a shalom to everyone and welcome to I Hope Bellagio's online Sunday service. We are so excited that you can join us this day. And beloved, today we have my dear mentor and friend, Reverend Dr. Stuart Tan, preaching to us from Grace City Church in Perth, Australia. Beloved, he started a series called Counting the Cost. And today the sermon that he's preaching on is entitled, what is your priority? Beloved, we pray that you, the Word of God will bless you and you will truly be encouraged in your walk with the Lord this day. God bless you. Let's look to the Lord to anoint us through the preaching of the Word through Reverend Dr. Stuart Tan. Come to this uh, new series called The Cost. You know, and I... When we are thinking about this, I, I thought about in the mid-70s when I was a young Christian and I remember the words, one of the short writing that I read was about a communist. A communist who wrote of what he thinks about Western Christianity. And this communist said this word, that communists will take the world but the Western Christianity will not work. And he said this, the reason why the communists will take the world is because we are willing to pay the price. We are willing to sacrifice. We are willing to pay the cost. But as for you, you are talking about the Western Christianity, you present a gospel that has no price, no cost, so easy. Of course, 30 over years have passed. We know that communism has faltered, but Christianity, Christianity in the West has become smaller. But Christianity in other parts of the world is marching strongly and powerfully. Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So when we were looking at this new series called The Cost, which deal with the heart saying of Jesus, there are 70 in the gospel, the thing that Jesus say that is very hard. Sometimes it's hard to understand or comprehend. Sometimes when you read this heart saying, it's so easy, you can grab hold, but it's hard to what? Hard to practice. Mark Tweet. Mark Tweet is a very famous and well-known writer. He said this, It is not what I don't understand about the Bible that bothers me. It is what I do understand. I don't know about you. What he's saying is in many hearts of believers, the heart setting of Jesus is not that we do not understand. It is, it is hard to what? Follow, hard to practice. Now, Jesus did not say this hard saying to make life difficult. How many realize that? You know, when, when I first read, I said, why, why does Jesus say all these things? I mean, don't he want to make life easy for me? But Jesus did not say this to make hard life difficult because in the time of Jesus, life was really very difficult. If you are well-to-do, you know, you stay in a one room 
two-level house. If you are poor, you stay in one room, one-level house. You know, and you are neither well-to-do or you have your own business like Joseph the carpenter. If not, you are a daily paid worker. The Bible talks about people who go and queue up waiting to be picked to go and work. Or you are a beggar or a slave. So when I think about why does Jesus say all this hard saying when life is already so difficult, and especially Jesus who came with a message of hope. With a message of hope, why do you throw some hard saying into your message of hope? And maybe, maybe someone should tell Jesus, you should read the book, How to Make Friends, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Because whatever Jesus did, with all his heart saying, he is chasing people away. I'm sure that if I were the disciple of Jesus, standing next to Jesus, where he opened his mouth and said all this heart saying, I'm sure like the disciple, I will be surprised and shocked. I'm sure I will say, Jesus, why you do such a thing? Because your heart saying is not going to increase membership. <laughs> it's not going to gather a crowd. It's not going to what, build up our bank account. You need to say something that is attractive, that, that people like to hear. But Jesus said all this hard saying. One time, he fed 5,000 people. And these people who are fed by him, the 5,000, decided, I want to follow Jesus. I mean, where can you go to to hear the world's greatest teacher? You don't have to do anything. You just sit down, you hear him, then he feed you some more. Then after he feed you, the Bible says, your basket full was corrected. That means you can have take away. I mean, where can you go? And yet, the Bible tells us that the 5,000 who heard him, many of them followed Jesus. Until Jesus turned around and he said this hard saying. He said this, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. And when they hear this, they were offended. They were offended. The Jesus that fed them, now they were angry at Him. They were offended with Him because they say, what you are saying is too hard to understand, too hard to accept. And so as fast as they came to Jesus, Jesus was like a maniac. As fast as they came, as far as they were, choop, disappeared. They departed and they didn't want to follow him. They were not keen to be Jesus' disciple again. When we look at the hard saying of Jesus Christ, you will find the hard saying of Jesus Christ will deal with these four things. One of these four things. First, it will deal with the cause of discipleship. We are all sons and daughters of God. Say amen. But we are also what? Disciples. We are sons and daughters because we put our faith in what? In Jesus Christ. We are disciples when we follow Him, learn from Him, and follow Him. You know that the Bible always talks about sons a few times. You can become the political son. <laughs> You can become the elder son or you can become the son who say, I will go to the vineyard, but the end didn't go. So the son has a choice to obey or not to obey. But as a disciple of Jesus Christ, when you say, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, means you're saying, that I'm going to follow this master, I'm going to learn from this master, and I'm going to be like this master. So, we are both sons, daughters, and disciples. And as disciple, you know, you know, it does not change. You know, sonship does not change, but discipleship does change as we walk with Christ to learn from Him and live for Him. I'm always a son, but as a disciple, I will change as I follow Jesus Christ and obey Him and walk with Him more and more each day. The hard saying of Jesus 
also deal with the issue of the heart. Because when you hear the heart saying, it provokes your heart, it challenges your heart, it examines your heart. Everything of what you are, what you do, what you say flows out of what? Out of the heart. So what Jesus said will hit the heart. And the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, you need to what? You need to protect, you need to wash over your heart because this is where life starts. The heart saying of Jesus deal with life choices. You are a product of your own life choice. But you can also become a victim of the life choice of others. You are the product of yesterday life choices. And what will happen to you tomorrow is based on what choices you make today. That's why God always asks us to choose what? Life, not death. Blessing, not cursing. Obedient, not disobedient. So the fourth thing that the heart saying of Jesus would deal with is what is important to you? What is first to you? And what is the motivation of your heart? Because Jesus Christ cannot take second place. He cannot be a spare tire. He cannot be, when I need Him, I call Him. He cannot be. Jesus Christ, you know, must be the only reason for your being and doing. What I am and what I do is because of who? Jesus Christ. So, when we do this six heart saying of Jesus, we want you to discuss in the powerhouse. And in the discussion at the powerhouse, each one of us must come to this place. This is a very foundation truth. This is a very important place when it comes to the teaching and the heart saying of Jesus Christ. This place you must come to. Because if you don't come to this place, then your Christian life is going to be chaotic. What is this place? You must come to the same place as Apostle Peter. Apostle Peter said this, after he heard the heart saying of Jesus Christ in John chapter 6. This is what Peter said. Master, to whom would we go? You have the word of real life, eternal life. We have already committed ourselves confidently that you are the Holy One of God. Peter said this word, no matter how hard Jesus say, I may not understand, I may not grab hold, I may find it hard to practice, but I know one thing, I can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. I can't do it by my own strength, but through the grace of God and through the strength of God, I am able to do it. And so you got to come to the place when you come to the heart saying of Jesus, say, Jesus, who else can save me? Who else can forgive my sin? Where can I go? And this is a very important thing. This is a very important thing in your Christian life. It is only Jesus or no one else. Not Jesus plus something. I think the West are trying to make Christianity so comfortable, so compromising. But it is only what? Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. He is God. He came, He died for us, He rose from the dead. So Peter said, who can we go to? We have no one, no religion, no other gods. There is only one. His name is Jesus. Because Jesus, we are only coming to you. Only you can promise me eternal life. Only you can guarantee that when I die, I will have eternal life in you. No other can. Only Jesus Christ. And for that reason, Peter said, we are committed to you. And that's where we need to be. Some of the hard saying of Jesus, I may not understand, but one thing I will do, I will not throw it away, I will put it to the sh on the shelf, and one day, one day, I will understand, 
I always say, oh God, that's what you mean. And then Peter said, I'm confident you are the Holy One of God. So we start with the first heart saying, the open door found in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 to verse 39. I entitle, I entitle, who is your priority? This is how it goes. Everyone who acknowledge me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Wow. Are you not glad, Henry, there is no mention about father-in-law? <laughs> your enemy will be in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your sons or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life, you will find it. Now, this is one of the first few verses that I read when I became a Christian. And I'm telling you, it shocks me. I say, how am I going to tell my mother that? How is my mom going to say you be a Christian? Because straight away she said, why you be a Christian? Because this Christianity is against family, against your mom. But you know, I was shocked. But then I found another verse, quite similar to this, in Luke. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. And he read this way, If you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. The God who talk about love, you said now you must hate. Your father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Of course, the other version, the message did not use the word hate. He said that you must refuse, if you refuse to let go, or if you put them more important than me, you cannot be my disciple. So it was quite a challenge because it's quite a tall order. It demands a lot of you, 100% and nothing less to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, one thing, Jesus will not take second place, He will not accept second best, and He will not have the leftover, and you can never be a disciple when you say, me, my, plus Jesus. No. Jesus won all of you. Your body, your soul, your spirit, or none at all. I read a book by Philip Yancey. He wrote this book called The Jesus I Never Knew. Now, <clears throat> we love the Jesus that suits us. The Jesus of our making, our likeness, and our convenience. The Jesus that is very nicely packed into our religiosity. In fact, the Jesus that is tailor-made and will not rock our boat. We are able to see a life with little change or no change, but every day blessed and happy. This is the Christianity that we want. COVID-19 has shaken Christianity. Not only has it shaken, it has also has shaken. I recently read an article that emerging from the far, far end is a little spark. And what is this little spark? This little spark is that there is now a new generation, young generation of Christianity, who is rising up and say, we do not want the Christianity that we are having in our world today. The Christianity that is contemporary, that has sound and light and music, the Christianity of entertainment. 
We want the Christianity that is traditional. This little spark is beginning to come up. Because that's what COVID-19 has done. It has bring us back to the basic. The basic of what Christianity is all about. The Jesus who said, I am the Prince of Peace. The angels that announced as he entered our troubled world, peace to all men and women on earth. Now this same Jesus said, I come not to bring peace to the earth. I come to bring a sword. Now this is challenging. The Jesus who said, I am a sword. But Jesus Christ is not a sword that steal, kill, and destroy. That is the devil. Jesus Christ is the sword that cuts the flesh and the spirit. This is the flesh. This is the spirit. Jesus Christ is the sword that divides. Divides. This is this and that is there. There is no such thing in the Bible as gray area. Gray area is what we have created. There is no such thing as what is blur. The Bible is very clear. Yes is yes, no is no. The Bible is what I will want to say as I first read. It is black or white. And that's not a racist statement. Very plain, very clear. And then he's a sort that separate. Separate what? Separate right from wrong, true from error, lies, and deception. Jesus Christ is the dividing line. The dividing line of priority in these three areas in your life. The priority of devotion, the priority of relationship, and the priority of self. So, as I continue this sermon, how will you answer this challenging priority question? Starting from outside to you in here. The outer circle, devotion, priority. Others or Christ. Devotion is what you love, what you give your life, your energy, your money, and time to. You can be devoted to God, to sport or hobby or to others, like I'm devoted to my wife, to my family, to my children, to my friend. I can be devoted to my job. I can de be devoted to things. So when you come to devotion priority, when people see you, how you live, What is the message? What is the picture they see? When it comes to devotion, when people see me from the outside, it must be first Jesus, say amen. Last, it must be Jesus. In between, it must be who? Jesus. He must be all and above all else. I know the message that I preach is a very hard message, not just for you, it's for myself. 30, 50 years I have followed. So 50 years or 45 years I have followed Jesus. I'm learning what it means. What it means to put Jesus first all the time. Here's what he said. Everyone who confessed me publicly here on earth, I will also confess before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Now, this word that Jesus said, is this word prophetic? that Jesus was saying this word in things to come because the early church was placed in the position to confess who is Lord. The early church was placed in the place. Is Jesus Lord or Caesar is Lord? Now, if they confess Jesus is Lord, he is dead. If they confess Caesar is Lord, their life is spared. And then if they confess Jesus is Lord, it's not a quick and, and easy death. It's a cruel and a slow death. What, how do they die? They are neither being crucified or they are waxed with oil and set on fire. Or they are thrown for the animals to torn them up or kill with the sword. 
Now, today, this is still taking place in many countries. Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world. We are here, we don't realize that. Open door state that more than 400, more than 340 million Christians worldwide experience high level of persecution. 13 Christians are dying for their faith every day. So, Jesus said, your devotion, is it others or me? Because if you are going to follow me, it's a life sentence. It comes with all forms of abuse, disadvantage, even for your family, for your job, for your career. We don't experience that. But in some other country, people do experience that. If you become a Christian, your job prospect it is very low. I met a long time ago an Iranian Christian in, in Brother Hoping Hostel. Young Iranian Christian. Uh, and he's a doctor, trained doctor. That fellow is very smart. He had got two degrees. He was working for hoping to do cleaning because with his doctor degree, he could not practice here. Young man, smart man. And he said this to me. In Iran, I work for the big Iranian hospital. I was actually an eyeball and my path was to be the head. But because I'm a Christian, there is no chance for me. Thank God. He took his doctor test here, conversion. The first test he passed. Can you imagine? I mean, we don't, we don't understand because we don't face them. But yet, I challenge you that there is no cheaper version of Christianity. The road is narrow and difficult. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to verse 14. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. Is, the gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find. Jesus himself said, this is the cause for falling me. For some people, it is their life. The only problem is, in the West, we are trying to open the gate as wide as possible. But that's not God's way. God's way is preach the truth. Preach what is in the Bible and let people choose whether they will follow me. And when they follow me, they know why they are following me. So, outwardly, my devotion priority is I confess I'm a Christian. The confession comes from what? The mouth. And the true confession does not come just from the mouth. It must flow from where? The heart. And when I confess, it means I'm agreeing with the someone. That's now when I confess Christ, I'm agreeing with who? With Christ. And therefore, in the Bible, in, in, in the Bible verb, the Bible verb is when I confess with my mouth, I must follow up with my what? With my action. My confession with my mouth must be supported by the action of my what? Of how I live, of my life. So when it comes to devotion, priority, confess Christ, not deny Christ, with your words and action. Choose Jesus and not others. Fear God and not fear man. Love God and not things. Obey God and not obey man. I pray that your devotion priority for Christ is so clear and so bright 
as the light and the salt in this broken world. The second, the middle circle, relationship priority. Family or Christ? I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against her father-in-law. Your enemy will be against her mother-in-law. <laughs> Makes a big difference. <laughs> your enemy will be right in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your sons or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. Relationship priority. Family of Christ. Since the day of Cain and Abel, conflict and tension among family, among sibling, is real and sure. Jesus did not say, I come to bring conflict. He did not say, I promote conflict. He never said, I intensify conflict in the family. Family itself will have conflict with this word called RPM. RAM. RPM. What is that? Three things will always bring conflict to the family. First is called religion. Discuss religion, there will always be conflict. The second is what? Politics. Discuss about politics, you will have problem. And the third is what? Money. <laughs> These are the three things they always have conflict. You know, when religion is Christianity versus other, the liver view, the, the, the conservative view, you know, the teaching and the doctrine. Then we fight over politics. Should we vote for the liberal? Or should we vote for the labor? Or should we vote for Pauline Hansen? You know, I, I mean, and then when it comes to money, people fight over inheritance, fight over responsibility, and you find that Jesus is saying that in the family, there is conflict. Maybe Jesus knew that because he came from a family of at least, what, seven. He got brothers and sisters. And I told you that they will stay in what? One house, one room. So there is conflict. Of course there is conflict. I don't know about you. I came from a big family, 10 of us, and four of us is in one room. So we all have our, our space to sleep. So you can imagine Jesus was talking about family conflict because maybe it's through his own personal experience. You know, he's he, he sitting Sibling was offended by him. They did not understand what Jesus was saying or doing. They did not believe that he's the son of God. They did not believe him. And sometimes they even ridicule him. And they say to the, to the other people, this brother of mine is out of his death. You know, he is out of touch. And he is out of his mind. So, when Jesus talked about family priority, is it family or Christ? He warned us that becoming a Christian may cause conflict at home, even at times. I remember those early days when you are from a Catholic family, you become a Christian. They excommunicate you. They will have nothing to do with you. How about those Muslims that become Christian? Some of them have to run away because the family wants to kill them. The early church most of them were Jews. They became Christians, some of them. Do you think there is no conflict at home? How about spouse that became Christian and their husband is unsafe? Is there no conflict? You know, even Paul, you know, his family did not like him when he became a believer. You know, they, they oppose him, they persecute him. His friends want to kill him. And such, such opposition is still happening when people of other faith become Christian. I wonder, have you ever faced persecution, opposition for being a Christian? Pastor Kara has. I have. Thank God for it. 
It was a real testing whether we want to believe or don't believe. You know, real testing. But I also have seen people who give up their faith because family opposition. And they are the, the seed that fell on stony ground. So when it comes to family relationship priority, Jesus never said that you should stop loving your family. He never said, hate your family. He said this, you must not love them more than one, more than me. Can you understand? The key, the key that Jesus said is more than me. If you love your family, your mother, your father, your children, anyone more than me, you cannot be my disciple. But Lord, I don't love them more than you, Lord. I'm a very fair person, Lord. I love them the same as you. Equal, equal, equal. And then the Lord said, you can also not be my disciple. <laughs> so what is Jesus saying? He's saying this. You have to love me more than them. Because there are things that I ask you to do. Because of your family, you may say no. Can you imagine? You want to go to Bible school? And your parents said no. I'm talking about even Christian parents can say no. You know, you want to give up your well-paid job to serve the Lord and your wife and your children ask you why? Or you want to obey the Lord and your brother and sister say, silly of you. Jesus said, this is what. You have to love them more than me. Nothing else. A couple comes here, getting married, and they are exchanging their vow. Could you imagine the bridegroom look at the beautiful bride and say to her, I will love you the same as I love my mother. <laughs> that is already one problem. But he is not so smart. He says the second thing, I love my old girlfriend more than I love you. What happened? I will visit him in the hospital. <laughs> this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying to you and to me, you got to love me more than others, more than your family, because you may have to do things that I ask you to do where your family may say no. Who will you obey? Who will you obey? Yesterday, I was doing the high schooler lesson and I, my lesson to them because we were making pasta and we have asked the parents to come, you know, to, to eat dinner. And I, I told the high schooler, look, our lesson today is this, honor your parents. Your father and mother is the command with a promise and you will go well with you and you will live long. I told them, yeah, you are all... Your parents are all Christian. So it's not difficult to honor them. My mother was a non-Christian. <laughs> when you love Jesus more than them, you are obeying the most important, the first and the greatest commandment. That is, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. When it comes to family priority, Jesus warned us that following Him, putting Him first and above all others will, bring, will cause conflict at home. Are you prepared for it? The key is this. Who else can I go? Only you have the what? The word of life. Now, we come to the inner circle, the deep. Yeah. This is where they say the rubber hits the road. Here. Yeah. The inner circle, personal devotion. My question to you is who? Self or Christ? And here, Jesus said this word, 
If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. In a culture that champions and promotes self above others. In fact, self above or equal to God. What is the language? The language you know, for our affluent, self-sufficient and self-reliant society. And this language, they say self. Look for, out for yourself. Think for yourself. Do everything for yourself. Please yourself. Live for yourself. So this self mindset has only one description. It's called what? It's called self-love. Love yourself. Eat like you love yourself. That's good. Move like you love yourself. Speak like you love yourself. Act like you love yourself. Love yourself is the only way to happiness and fulfillment. Is it true? No. An increase of mental health problems in our society tells you self-love ain't going to help you. The man who wrote Imitation of Christ Thomas uh, Kippis, you must know that self-love is the most is more harmful to you than anything else in the world. Christianity today, Charles, this is uh, this formulation: love thyself, then your neighbor. Not love your neighbor, then yourself. Love yourself first, then your neighbor. It's a license to unrending self deduct self indulgence. Because the quest for self-love is what? Endless. We all know King Solomon. King Solomon started very well, but in his later years became a self-love man. He has the power and resources to be and to do. Nothing held him back. What he wants, he got. He tried endless pleasure, mega project, and accumulated huge possession. He has it all and done it all. And his conclusion was, emptiness is emptiness. All is emptiness. Because out of self-love come these two twin sisters. These two are sisters of self-love. Self-indulgence and self-deception. Because self-love is idolatry. What is Jesus' answer for self-love? Is to put God first before self. And how do you take, do it? Take up the cross and follow me. And when do you take up the cross? Not when you like it, when it suits you. Take your cross every day and follow me. He said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish way, take up your cross daily and follow me. Apostle Paul said, I die daily. Daily I die. No one can bear your cross. No one can carry your cross. Are you willing? When it comes to personal priority, self or Christ? Would I say Christ first? I'm willing to surrender my agenda, my ambitions, my dream, my ease and my comfort for Christ. The call is that whoever it takes to remain faithful to God and to be His disciple, that you must be willing to what? To do self love equal self destruction. Jesus said, If you seek your own life, self seeking equal what? You will lose it. Self losing. What is the key? The key is when it comes to personal priority, self or Christ, live not for self, because if you live for self, it is. A lost end. The only choice is to live for Christ. Christ first in your personal priority. The cause of discipleship is deny self, take up the cross, and follow Jesus. And this is what Jesus charged His disciples when they want to follow Him. And this is the message of Jesus to His disciples. And His disciples continue this message to us. 
So where does he leave us? You should walk away from my sermon today and from this series of the course. You should walk away that he is Lord, there is no one else. You should walk away, he is my number one and no one else. You should walk away and say, I may not be able to follow everything that Jesus say, but I know one thing. If I ask the Holy Spirit to help me, to empower me, He will. Because He is the most important person in your life. He is the greatest and the only priority as a disciple of Jesus Christ. He comes before others. He comes before your family. And He comes before self. Are you willing? Are you willing? Lord, help me. This is my prayer. Lord, help me. And this is where, this is where the answer to sanctification takes place. The answer to sanctification is not how much you know. It's how much you practice what you know. Shall we pray? I even sing that song. Oh, King of glory, fill this place. King of glory, fuse my heart. When you fuse my heart, as I was standing there singing a song, when my heart is filled with you, I, I, it's so easy to say yes to you, O oh God. Lord, I want you to fill my heart so that I, I'm ready to say yes. Because sometimes as Christians, you, you can become dry and your heart can become so mundane and, 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 and so dull that it's so hard to say yes. But when God fills your heart, it is so easy to say yes to Him. Thank you, Pastor Stuart, for that wonderful word of encouragement. Beloved, I believe in this time that we are going through, it is a time of testing, but it is also a time to take stock and to prioritize and to realize what our priority is as Christians, as disciples, as children of God. Beloved, um, I hope Bellagio may be physically shut, but we still continue to have activities. We have our prayer meeting every Thursday night between 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Waktu Indonesia Barat or West Indonesia time. Uh, if you would like to join us, please send, uh, make a call to the church office to give us your details so that we can uh, contact you and give you the, uh, the Google Meet link. And beloved, we also have our Bible study every Monday between 7 p.m. to about 8.30. It is a time of the study of the book of Acts. Beloved, we really encourage you. Uh, this is a church that encourages not just worship service, but the reading of the word, the study of the word, as well as prayer. Beloved, we are a house of prayer and a house of the word of God. We are of our church is based upon the word of God and its foundations. Beloved, we encourage you to join us for either the Bible study or the uh, prayer meeting. Please contact the church office so that we can get your details and forward to you the Google Meet link. Uh, beloved, we've come to the end of our service and at this time we would normally uh, conduct the collection of God's tithes and offerings uh, but since we are not able to gather physically we, we would appreciate very much if you would give generously and uh, pay your tithes and give your offerings to the BCA account which is shown at the bottom of the screen and uh, beloved, it is a truly an act of worship Giving is also an act of worship. It's not just singing songs and reading the Word and listening to the Word of God being preached each Sunday, but giving is also an act of worship and adoration unto Him. So we ask uh, that you give generously. I hope Bellagio is a fairly uh, large facility that we have a significant cost that we have to bear each month. So beloved, we ask that you give generously, you pay your tithes faithfully, and you give unto the Lord through this church. We pray that uh, God continue to bless you as you give faithfully and give generously. Hallelujah. Beloved, we've come to the end of our service. Let's all stand as we close in prayer. And, uh, and we end with the benediction. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads. 
Father Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the word of God that has come to us. And Lord, even as we encounter uh, difficulties and challenges, and as Pastor Stuart has spoken about even persecution for, for people who have come to uh, or decided to uh, accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, there is a price to pay and there are priorities that are to be made. But Lord, we know that Lord, you work all things for good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So Lord, we believe, Lord, we believe that as we put you first, Lord, you will continue to guide us and lead us in the right way. As we submit to you, Father, your purpose and plan for us, in obedience, Lord, we follow, and Lord, we know that you have the best plan for our lives. And Lord, it, it, not, it may not always seem uh, so uh, wonderful, but Lord, we know that at the end of the day, Lord, your plan and your purpose is the best plan. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We ask for your hand of protection upon us in the coming days, Lord. Your providence follow us and your covering of your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us. Lord, I pray a hedge of protection around each person and their families, Lord. In the midst of this pandemic, Lord, protect us and provide for us. And we ask, Lord, for your favor, Lord, in all things that we do. That, Lord, everything we do is an act of worship unto you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Please lift your hands to receive the benediction. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, receive the blessings of the Lord. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now go with the blessings of the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all until Christ comes again. Amen. God bless you, beloved. Continue to follow the government protocols of safe distancing and personal hygiene, and please wear a mask. We pray that you continue to stay safe until we gather again next week. Be well and God bless you.